I'm worried that they're not going to be lesson nine, and then I'll let the slides say that some of them will be the suspense is good. Um, so, 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 so um, Jimmy asked me to point this out. So, uh, it's a free workshop in Liverpool on the 17th of the month. It is in the um, so it's kind of an introduction to critical psychology, but next up PHP UK conference. So um, that's I think this month. Uh Conflict Triple London. Um so it takes on sale, this is the big uh, hopefully it was a bit close there. They will start to release the speakers in the table. So it's uh, it's also Drupal training days. There's a lot packed in this week, this uh, people who come. So you've got the 13th week, which is this the October. And that also has some Drupal training, long sessions, so about Tuesday on that day. We've also got a session on Saturday, as well as the main conference. So, we will go to try to visit everything. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. Yeah. Uh, Peter Yorkshire, um, hope there was a close of things, so we'll have to speak with you soon. So it takes over into the yeah. uh, PHP Wales, so the first people that have to put um, a key that's a thing for four pages in the Anything else on this? Yeah, we That's the campus. <laughs> Uh, news, so not to be on this month, and Google's working to go So So, as far as the part of the the site specific specific the folders So, in the you see my This is sort of sort of fills the nation thing. That's a big user. <laughs> The basic what I'm trying to do is standardize this approach to third party developers. This is just going to and yeah, so it's not like using it. Uh, the only announcement last couple weeks for security in this one. So, it's been an access bypass, but you have to implement it your own program in the world. So, it introduces some of uh, my backups. So, we had to check out the thing, but uh, I couldn't see any of the things. This is interesting. So, the uh, first semantic version of distributed modules published uh, on February 5th. 
So um, it's, it's called uh, the simpler example of the door, uh, but it has a deeper commitment. So that's coming soon to a good verse of harmony. Um, which is good because it's sort of the only thing that's sort of kind of the circumstances, which is this weird, not quite composed with the surrounding creation. So this is good. Uh, as to the session ranking, the registers with the session project. Um, uh, so basically, you can, as a developer, you can um, register some, some sort of custom session bucket that you, you can attach things to that will work to the, to the system. So I imagine that things that work are probably different ones because they use that for them, not for the business. Uh, the workflow module uh, earlier today, before we spoke, um, has now spots variants. So you can actually have a uh, workflow <laughs> split off fields into variants and have different types of the same form. Uh, which a couple of our clients is now absolutely built in because they have hundreds of forms that are different by a single field. And this will solve that problem completely. Which is great. Uh, and they also said that. Spot AB testing can be very easy to see which performs better, which seems good. Just to keep you aware that the Drupal 9 documentation has been updated, so um, yeah, like what's included, how to compare. So if you're wondering what's going on with the other ones, it's in the box, national.org. In the news, not a lot, so <laughs> okay. uh, in one I think we are. I think we did your own. See, so CTI yeah. continuous recruitment, right? <laughs> Same access really. <laughs> and anyone here not CTI ever access or no one else? So next meetup will be 10th of March. Um, TPC at the moment. We should see. Um, right, so. Cool. <laughs> 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 Um, so I, the, the context for this is that I've been helping with the can't see I know, but I need to sit, otherwise I'm going to be like, then over from the laptop and that big. That kind of works. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. We should. Sorry. <laughs> um, I've been helping put together a sort of distribution um, that we can use at CTI for upcoming projects. And part of that has been um, like auditing what country we want to go into. And the approach I've used has been basically just to try and learn the stuff and see what sticks. Um, it's obviously not all going to end up in our distribution or our you know, starter kit, but I found some quite interesting, cool little things. Um, the downside to doing this at the Drupal meetup and a lot of regular Drupal people, so you might probably know. Majority of these, but there are, there are some that are used to me, um, and there are some that might be used to people outside of agency contacts. So I watch this on YouTube, or <coughs> if I do it again, I think that's something like that. So, hopefully, everyone finds at least one new thing. Um, and if you don't, then I'll buy you a beer and if you want. So, I'm going to be using like, this little demo site to, to talk to us for it all. Um, I've put together Kind of cheesy little script, like journey type thing we're going to go through. Um, otherwise, it's just going to be me reading out from post a JSON file, which I don't think anyone would really be like, interested in. So, if we close down all the stuff that I was working on earlier. Um, so, we're going to talk through this site, um, go through what's on it, what modules do different bits of it, um, and then some little flour flourishes that I've added. And hopefully, Lando won't have gone to sleep while my laptop lid was close to save battery. 
uh, it looks like a map. So that's why it looks way up. Like that moves. And so let's start by trying to log in. This one you probably know about. This is one of the ones that's like the popular ones, but you might not know if you don't make three precise commercially. And so we're trying to go to forward slash admin. And two things have happened. First thing is that we haven't got a forbidden page. So that's coming from the R403 to login module. So what this module does is rather than give people horrible access denied, forbidden, turns it wrong, you have a terrible person, show away a message, it redirects them to the login form and it says, please log into this page. It's a pretty standard um, module that we use in lots of sites. And you also see the destination is in the URL. So when I log in, I'm going to go to forward slash admin, carry over my journey, just a bit nicer. Second thing that's happened here is we are not on our front end theme anymore. So normally the logins form, the password reset form, and the reg user register form would you use your front end theme rather than your admin theme. And what we've done here is we've installed a module called admin login path, which comes from the admin alignment distribution. And that uses the admin theme for things like your know, password reset, register, and user login forms. And I quite like that because it means the front end theme doesn't have to be concerned with things that are kind of user management back end theme. And it means if your site doesn't have forms on it anywhere else, you don't have to style forms just for the sake of login thing. Um, and it helps reassure some people that aren't used to Drupal via a content management system where the front end and back end are kind of meshed together. So we're used to sort of navigating in and out of the back end of Drupal. We're used to things like contextual links and place editing, layout builder, those sort of things, which is quite a meshed experience. But for people who are used to sort of um, like maybe commercial CMSs or just other ones, they're surprised when Drupal has the back end and the front end on the same domain, let alone um, looking the same. So this gives a sort of false distinction between the two. So if we log in, in fact, no, let's not do that. Let's remove destination from the URL. So now we're just hitting user for slash login. And so we get the same admin form. What we're going to do now is, is log in. And we end up on the content list in view. So this is slightly different to what before in that normally we'd be sent to our profile page. Um, but like, I don't think anyone really cares about their profile page. So it would, for me, it would just say root. If I was working in an organization, I wouldn't really be interested in how long I've been a member of that organization's website for, which is what the standard profile page shows. So instead, we send them somewhere useful, which is to redirect our the login module. You see there's quite a lot of example content now. So this site I, I just rebuilt about an hour ago. Um, so this is, is content that comes like with, with the distribution. We've got some example content like this uh, home page, the second level page, which is going to be used to test breadcrumbs and test the drop down menu in the front end. We've also got some things like page not found um, page, <laughs> uh, terms and conditions, privacy policy, that sort of thing. And they're there so that we can link to them um, with the EU cookie compliance module, so if you link to privacy policy, you know there's always going to be a no yeah, privacy policy. Um, and in the site settings, we configure page not found as a custom 404 page. That's coming from the default content module, um, which is another like quite a big one, but compared to how we did default content a couple of years ago, which is this horrible like um, migrate-based approach with sort of YAML files and, and um, writing a lot of boilerplate code to get example content working. Default content is an entirely different beast. Um, so if anyone that hasn't used it, you build your content through the Drupal UI as if you were making a regular page. And then there's a set of Drush commands which export that config to, um, to your, like, your file system. Um, so it's called default content, not example content. It uses quite a lot of other sort of core and um, specific modules like the how module and serialization. 
So it's, it's doing some work itself, but it's also relying on a lot of other things. So it's tied into the ecosystem. And so let's go to some docs. So you build all your content, and you can have um, the entity references in there, you can reference media, which then turn references as files. And if you run the DCER command, which is this one, it will export not just node one, two, three, but also everything that node references. And um, so it's saying here that in modules custom, general modules content. But if we go to our actual site in PHP Storm, um, and then go to Rocket Example Content, which is the name of the distribution, you can see inside this content directory, um, I know it's small, but I don't have to zoom in PHP Storm. There's JSON files for basically everything um, that comes in that default set of content. So our menu links, which we use to test that the mega menu works, are all in there. That also covers things like Twitter links, um, to link to the privacy policy and so on, that they are on every single site. Um, each node is represented, the paragraphs in that node, save ourselves scrolling, um, and even users. Um, so we have an example user for each role, so like a site admin role and a more content role. Um, and all of that is, is output by running these sort of crash commands. It's really cool, um, and it's just so different to how we used to do it on content. That is cool. It's, um, um, <clears throat> as an alternate, it sort of does what Umami does, but you do your own. Yeah, <laughs> so I think if, if Umami could use contract modules, they could maybe use this approach, but obviously it has to just use core, so they have to build their own. So, What's your strategy for so you can do a risk of the Oh, okay. So they're in the risk of the program. They are, yeah. So they're in the risk of the program. I suspect we'll move that way eventually. The, the reason why we haven't done that so far is it's a really new sort of approach. We've only just started using it on, on different projects. Um, and at the moment, we have a mix of dummy content, but also content we want to Permanent, like the 404 page in the privacy policy. We also use it um, to provide a few other things. So, it, what we're seeing here is it being used for nodes, um, but you can use it for any entities. So, another thing we use is config pages. So, config pages is a really cool module um, where you can build forms with for UI. Um, uh, okay, I'll make one now. Oh, I'll run right in one. So, if you've got some custom functionality like um, a copyright block or a set of social media links in Twitter, um, you can build <coughs> form using the tools that we're used to when we build content types. And so, I can't remember. To edit it rather than actually view one. Let me just search. Is that the page we were just on? Yeah. This looks more like it. Okay. So this all looks familiar from, from building content types and um, or other uh, sort of entity based things. So we go to manage fields, we can see we've got an entity reference, revision, field, and um, social paragraph. Um, and we're referencing footer, social link, platform paragraphs. So this is not a super advanced example, but you can use any field widget provided by field UI. Um, so you build these things for the UI, and then you can expose them to your like, customers um, as regular forms. <coughs> you can set a menu path for them, um, and you can also do some like, context-related stuff. So if I want to add um, 
go on to add the new name to my sort of social media bit at the bottom. I can do it on that listing page we just on because we might have groups or company pages together. But I can also do it through web services because that's where I'm placing it in the admin menu. So these are all a paragraph. Um, this is just a standard link field. And this is a, actually a module that I built for this distribution. So there's this really cool website called Simple Icons. And it's like an open source project. Basically, if there's a brand out there, someone would have made a nice SVG for it that sort of scales and everything, and they'll provide the brand color. You can see there's like absolutely millions in a really pleasing arrangement. So I, I built this module which reads a JSON file from the Simple Icons project um, and just puts it into Drupal, basically. So this is a Facebook icon, but if I wanted to change it to a link to like an Etsy store, use the Etsy SVG icon, or Evernote, or any of these things, which is probably overkill, but it's, it makes it super flexible, and it means if your client wants to add like a WeChat link or something, you don't have to work out how to find an SVG of a service that we're not necessarily super familiar with. So that's cool to simple icons. And um, the config page stuff, that's exportable through some content, so through default content as well. And that's one of the reasons why at the moment it's all done together, because we have this stuff which the site relies on, like the config page and the 404 page and so on. And then we have the live example content, which obviously it doesn't rely on. So what we've been doing is when the project starts, just emptying out that example web page and just rebuilding this on my page with that client specific content on there. So it goes from being like CGI demo content to being client specific. And then we can curate against that. And when the client logs onto their site, they see some quite familiar things. So let's go and talk about editing content some more. Um, so let me go and edit that for a call page we were talking about. So when I started building all this stuff, I realized quite quickly that I wanted to modify some CK editor stuff. And uh, well, CK editor config, which I couldn't do through like the normal text formats UI. So I found this cool module called CK editor underscore config. And I'll show you what we've done with that. So what this does is it lets you pass um, basically a JavaScript object to the CK editor instance. And you can do that to tweak things which are kind of a lower level than do I want a bold button, do I, what heading level do I want? It's more things like when you use a paste in content, um, do we want to force the remove word formatting option? Um, we also use it, it's just down here. So you can see we're forcing the paste in word cleanup prompt, and um, we're removing <laughs> font styles because we never want those. Um, and we're setting some body classes on the CK editor instance itself. So we're using Tailwind, which is a, a post CSS plugin that generates utility classes based on the configuration file. So we feed a, a set of font sizes, a set of colors, and it generates um, all these classes for us. There's ways of accessing all that stuff in class, um, but rather than like write a specific selector for the CK editor instance, we're passing it this body class and um, think that actually gets turned into a string. And that's why when we're on our CK editor, we get like the right line height, and the fonts are correct, the font size is correct, the link colors are correct. And probably a few other things. We also <laughs> remove the one section. What's the name? Uh, it's CK editor underscore config. What I'll do is I've got like my little notes. After the talk, I'll extract all the URLs from there and put it on like drive the docs or the gist or something, so we don't need to write them down. And bizarrely, the CK editor disables your browser spell check, which I didn't know. Like, I, I knew there was that spell check because you type it again, but I didn't know they actually disabled the browser one. I think they do that to not confuse people because the right click is usually the CK editor context um, menu. But if you hold down like, your command key, 
Oh, I love to the internet and browser one. So, <laughs> so <laughs> I didn't see the point of being in the circle, so now it's not the circle. Um, and we get we get like requests to bid and requests to tender. It's like, can you enable spell check? Like it's in your browser. <laughs> but turns out it's not always in your browser. Um, if we jump back to our CK to config, there's quite a lot of filters. Um, so I've become like a bit of a filter convert. I didn't really know that much about them before, but I found some really useful ones. Um, so we're quite reliant on, maybe not reliant, but we want people to use this uh, full HTML format all the time. We haven't got any other ones at the moment. The issue with that is Drupal also provides a plain text one, and if you use those permissions, you use either the plain text format or the full HTML one, they're usually given an option. In this case, we don't want them to have an option. So there is a module called Allowed Formats, which lets you set the allowed formats at the other level. So on our respect <coughs> paragraph, we set it to only allow this one format. And in that way, our filters will get used. And that's important because we've got stuff in here that's quite important. So we we don't use Bootstrap fully, but we bring in some parts of it for the things that are like boring but important. And one of those is tables. And um, so if no one really wants to spend like their time writing CSS for tables because it's not that exciting and we want them to be good because tables are important, but it doesn't need to be special for each project. So we put in all the bootstrap stuff for tables. The problem with that is it needs tables to have a dot table class. And if you want the table to be responsive, if you want it to scroll sideways in small screens, you have to wrap your table in a div with table hyphen responsive. Um, and you can kind of configure CK to be part of that. You can make it so when you add a table um, in the modal that pops up, table as a class is pre filled. Um, but a nice way is to enable this module. <laughs> which is amusingly called table ds filter, um, and that stands for bootstrap. So what that does is it defines any tables in your full HTML um, content. It will wrap them, and if you ask it to, if it's got configuration, it will wrap it in that div that makes it responsive, and it will add the dot tables to CSS class, so that's good. We're also using um, pathologic, which has been around forever. Um, and what that does is you give it your site can live on. So like your QA URL, your stage URL, like pre-prod, whatever you want, want to call that. <laughs> and if it finds, it does lots of things, but if it finds um, links, for example, to the stage site, on the live site, it will rewrite them. So you can see here we've got a bit of a placeholder thing where you put in the client project key and you find those. <coughs> And that means if a client is making all their content on stage and they forget to use Linker, and as a result, they link directly to stage.client forward slash my very important page. When we deploy the site to live, Pathologic will process that text. And if it sees any links to stage, it will rewrite them to use the production URLs. So that avoids these sort of like launch day problems where someone's manually made a load of content and it's going to the wrong place. It also does some other quite cool stuff, like it makes all the links either full with HTTPS uh, or protocol relative. <coughs> and that's quite useful because if you have just relative URLs but you send out an HTML email or someone's consuming your content through an API, that relative URL might not make any sense in the context of that person viewing it. So if I was like reading the email on gmail.com and my Drupal site using the relative URL, I would try and send me to gmail.com slash build podcast or whatever. So by letting it rewrite our URLs and make things a bit more predictable and a bit safer. There's also this cool module called config overrides and it will warn you in, in the sort of back end UI if you're trying to change something which has been overwritten in settings.php. So when we spin up a project there's a script that changes all these things for us um, and that's why it's saying that I can put what I want in here, but it won't really make much difference because it's, over, it's been overridden at settings.php level. Um, 
maybe that's not really super important, but it might save someone from tearing the hair out if they're not used to have settings of PHP works. And we have a sysadmin who constantly complains about how do they conflict management works, and maybe it's still teaching that just if it doesn't work, check the settings of PHP. Um, <coughs> We've got some other filters, and we've got one called safe external links, which makes external links target blank, and it also adds these um, no referrer attributes, which is kind of a security thing. And if you don't do that, then uh, like Google Lighthouse will, will penalize you a little bit. If you open an external link with target blank, that site that you open can actually, um, through JavaScript, Make a reference back to the page that launched it. So there's kind of a security issue there. This site can sort of interact with your page as if you're still on it. I don't know the details too much, but there is a lighthouse for that, and you'll get dinged if you don't have those attributes. And um, I'm not going to go through all of these, but a particularly cool one is this little tokens thing. And um, so this basically runs oops, this runs your text content through a filter that replaces tokens with actual values. And we do that, um, we use that in a few places. So if we search for, uh, no, let's just search for pages. As well as the social media thing I showed earlier, we've got a second one, which is for the like obligatory copyright Registered trademark, blah 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 type stuff. Um, and what we've got here is a token for the current year, a token for the site name, um, and so that will update every year. The client can obviously change this if they don't want to use a different site name, but it's there for them initially, it's there for us, so we don't have to configure it each time. We also use the token stuff, um, and this is probably a little flourish which we might not keep forever. Um, but on our custom 404 page, there's this button on like this, this mail to link. And um, if we add, well, tree inspector, that might be easier. We, what we've done here is we've used, yeah, it's definitely not easier. <laughs> um, we've used tokens basically to put in the site's webmaster email. And so we'll go to like webteam at client.com. And it will also use a token to include the current page's URL. So if I click on this, um, it's going to take me to Gmail and we'll see that it's sent to adminexample.com. It's got a broken link on the subject, done a broken link on the site name, trying to access this page at this time. So I don't know if the clients will actually come in. What else should we talk about? Um, quite often, so I, I mostly do front end work, and quite often we build these components that have like different variants. So if it's a card component, they might have um, it might be a regular card, it might be an image card. And I found a really cool module called Entity Reference Display. So if I go and add, I want to do for the content listing section of cards. If I reference a piece of content. Um, that isn't the current page. We've got this display mode field. So there's a set of options, card, image card, and teaser. And if I go to edit this paragraph type, I'll show you how that works. So that, those, those three things we saw, card, image card, and teaser, they're all um, display modes on our, our like content. Um, well, generic content content type. So, bit of managed fields. Display mode is this display mode field type. So, if we edit that, we can see that um, all of the display modes on the site will be listed there, and we can include or exclude them. So, this checkbox flips it around. So, it says card image guarantees are excluded, actually they're being included, so we data there. So you can see we've got the sort of standard Drupal display modes, like media library, preview, RSS, and so on. But we've also got our custom ones, card image card. And what happens is in the display settings, 
for your NC reference field. You can tell it to use the suspected display mode. So rather than have label NCOD rendered into the sort of the standard core stuff, we put suspected display mode and in the settings, um, after our settings, uh, it will use the value of the display mode uh, on against that entity. And so that's really useful when you just want to allow people to split between things without having to do a very quick project. So previously what we would have done is we would have had that as a sort of standard list field. We would have had a list option for card, a list option for image card, a list item for teaser. Um, and then we would have had some twig which got the field value of that field and then had like an if um, statement for each thing, which is fine, but this way it's not it's not doing any twig logic. Um, it's easy to add new ones. My images are broken. <laughs> And um, you can see here we've got regular cards, two cards in a grid. These are the image cards, which are normally the background, um, or just like some teasers as if it was a search result page or something. And if we go back to editing now, these are like, I've got two modules now, which are kind of silly ish ones, but also at the same time quite nice. So if we make some changes, and then I really hope this works. I try and navigate away, got a little prompt. So this is something that users are used to from like their Gmail, from their Google Docs, from their Confluence, whatever. And um, it doesn't want you to leave the page unless you confirm you really want to or you submit the form. So if we cancel this, we'll stay on the page. And then if we want to, we can go and save it with the changes. And um, so that's it's just a few lines of JavaScript. So maybe it doesn't need to be a module, maybe you bring it into like your own theme or your own or your admin theme or your own modules. But it's quite a nice stuff there. Something else on a similar thing or something. Oh yeah, sorry. That's called node edit protection. Um, and that comes from the bar based distribution, which has got quite a lot of interesting stuff in that. Um, another one. Say I have made my changes and I'm on a really long page. I don't want to scroll down to the bottom. If I press Command and S or Control and S, that will submit the form and save the page. So again, it's something that Drupal Core doesn't do, but people are used to it because every other web application does it. So that's called hotkeys for save. So two sort of admin interface related ones there. Another thing you might notice, go to search is we haven't got any local tasks here. So normally we would have had like view, edit, replicate, maybe preview. There's no local task tabs. And the reason for that is we're using the um, moderation sidebar module. So this is a, an app module um, by Sam Nelson. And it puts all your local tasks in a um, off-campus menu. So the advantage of that is, again, it's kind of like a distinction between your front-end styles and your back-end styles. We, we don't have these tabs taking up lots of space here. Um, if we don't want to style local tasks, perhaps we don't have to. And it also brings in some, some moderation stuff, hence the name. So often content moderation, it adds like an extra field, like a sort of pseudo field, which takes up quite a lot of space on the top of your pages. People don't always need it, so we thought we'd hide it away with this off canvas thing. Um, so replicate is the replicate module, which is lets people clone pages. And um, this preview module is quite interesting. So the actual name of this is view modes display. And what view modes display is is it provides one page which shows um, the same piece of content in each display mode. So that's our card display, it's our full content display, it's our image card display, and that's our teaser. Um, so it's an easy way for a CMS user to kind of see how their piece of content they're working on might be presented. <laughs> um, and it still has the same problem, so obviously a card and then be that big. And um, should we say some here handle that sort of thing? Something else I found that I didn't know about is the Minify HTML module. And um, so this isn't working for me. Because I'm in my local dev environment, so my developer settings are turned on. 
But if I was on the production environment, it would all be minimized, so there'd be sort of no white space at all. Um, I don't know what performance difference that made, but some <coughs> performance testing tools do say minify everything just for the sake of it. So if you want to get like those extra few percentage points on Lighthouse or on HP Insights or whatever, and um, that's an easy way to, to get that, that sort of learning through. It also helps the like, massive amounts of white space that Twig adds if you don't use the white space control things in Twig, which I don't because like, life's too short. But this way at least it hides the problem. Um, for breadcrumbs, I've always, like, I remember the first few Drupal projects I worked on breadcrumbs were a nightmare. Um, we use the easy breadcrumb now, which uses the it uses the, the um, basic URL, so it passes the URL for what slash is, and then it pulls um, the menu details out. So we haven't got it on the page on found because breadcrumbs there don't make sense. But if you go to one of our example pieces of content, um, yeah, it's one of those modules that you kind of hopefully you sort of set it and forget about it. But I've, I've not really worried about breadcrumbs for a while now. Um, the URL structure comes from path auto, which comes from the menu, and now the bread comes from the URL, so it all kind of cascades down. And it just seems to work. Um, it takes over the core breadcrumbs block and it lets you do a few extra things. Like if you if you don't want the home there, you can remove it. It will add the current title as an unlinked um, entry to the breadcrumbs. And um, you can sort of customize the separator a lot more nicely. It's a cool module and it's not given us any any grief. Um, it's just one of those things that sort of gets on the job quite quietly. Which is cool. The way we hit the breadcrumbs. Oh, the way we hit the breadcrumbs on the four four is with a condition. So this is something that I, I didn't know too much about before. Um, but it turns out in Drupal there's millions of these like condition plugins, and I think the main thing I use them for at least is controlling block visibility. We've got one called response code condition. So if um, if the symphony response code isn't 200, basically, um, if it's not okay, if it's a page not found or some sort of error, error, you can use that condition to hide and show stuff. So in this case, we're avoiding showing breadcrumbs on four and more pages because they would just say the home page not found, which isn't absolutely useful. And there's loads of those condition plugins, and there's something called block visibility. Groups. So when you have too many plugins going on, you can start arranging groups. Um, I haven't used that, not yet, but um, I think it's quite widely used. And something else that's really cool is the URL embed module. Um, so this this is an interesting one. It, it came out of um, when sort of media wasn't in core. So if you go to the URL embed, here we go. We can see that it comes from the Drupal Media team and it's supported by like a lot of our Acro and Epic systems. There's, there's some like, heavyweight names behind it, but it's kind of not really being maintained anymore. Um, so, yeah, if you look at the release dates yourself, 2016, 2017, um, quite a lot of issues and some that are hanging in RT RTBC that haven't really gone anywhere. So, I kind of I'm not sure how I feel about this because it's, it does work and it seems to work really well, but I don't know what its future is. But if I show you what it does, you might see the appeal of that. And so let's go and just stick a new component on a page. The module itself is kind of a wrapper for a composer plugin, and the composer plugin is called Embed. And what it does is, if you pass it a URL, it will hit that URL and it will look for things like um, our embed endpoints, um, open graph meta tags, basically any sort of structured content that it can scrape from that page. And it will give you a, um, a set of data which you can use to represent that content. So, what we've used it for on this distribution is an our embed component. So, OMED is a standard that says 
If I'm a website like Twitter or Facebook or YouTube, I can provide a known URL, and if the person passes the parameters to that URL, that includes things like the URL of the tweet or the URL of the YouTube uh, video, the overhead endpoint will respond with a little JSON with things like thumbnail images, what timeline content is added to the service, and so on. So if we add a tweet, and um, this is one I sent earlier about tonight. So all the CMS users have to do is put in the URL. They don't have to worry about sort of copying and pasting in HTML or JavaScript. If we save that, what we'll see is at the bottom of our page not found, we'll have a flash of text. <coughs> oh, we won't because there's a destination in the URL. And um, so if you load the page, what we'll see is there's a flash of text, but then quite quickly, the full tweet loads. And um, so this works for Twitter, it works for loads and loads of other things. And you can put Reddit posts in there, you can put like GitHub posts, um, and all it takes is a URL. There's also a demo site for the composer package. So if we put in like PHP uh, embed demo, you can see I've been on it earlier. So <coughs> This is a Vimeo, and um, so I've just passed in a URL of Vimeo video. So we get the title, the description, the URL, and the type of the content, some tags, a placeholder image, or in fact, a set of placeholder images, the actual code is displayed in bed itself, and then some metadata like the width and height, aspect ratio, provider, all that sort of thing. I think the Drupal module. Um, at least out of the box, it just gives you the code because that's what most people want. Um, but I think you can get access to all this stuff as well. I don't know if it exposes the template, but you would be able to get it back from the code package for sure. I suppose you know if there's a WYSIWYG filter that does a similar thing. Um, yeah, and then you can put like tweets in the blog post. Yeah, so, so that's something that I think WordPress is out of the box, and I think <coughs> like the other thing to do, like Medium, I think on Medium, if you put in a gist, you're about to turn into a code in there. Uh, I think it does have a wizard with it, okay. But remember the dates on the releases that <laughs> might not work with C code and core, or no, you can find out. And if this doesn't do it, there's probably someone else that's made an own bed filter because it seems like an obvious thing to have, and it's, yeah. it's things that other, other CMSs and platforms do have. And um, coming to the end of it now, um, I want to talk a bit about image optimization. Um, so something I didn't know about is this thing called image optimized pipelines. So it's, it's separate from image files, and it's it's really focused less on sort of transformations like cropping and resizing, and more about optimizations. So there's a sort of a suite of modules for it. And um, image optimize is the main module, and then it's got sort of related modules for different services. So there's this service called Resmasher, um, and that's an, a, a, an API basically where if you post a file to it, it will give you back the same file, but it will be losslessly compressed. So it's like JPEG sizes. Um, so that's using a third party service. Um, it's been around for a while and it's free, but you might not be comfortable with that, or you might have a client that doesn't want their images being posted all over the internet, which might be fair. And so there's a second one called Image Optimize API Binaries. And that's what we're seeing here. Um, I don't have the binaries installed on my VM, but if I did, every time I add an image and use this pipeline, it would be run through either JPEG Optim or Quant, which are command line tools that do the same thing as Resmusher. There's also another cool one, which I haven't actually got enabled, um, and it's called um, I'm just checking that I'm giving you the right names all this time. It's basically like similar to JPEG, but a lot more efficient. And um, so you'll see much smaller file sizes and you'll be better on Google Lighthouse tests. 
there's a Google Lighthouse or Webex called uh, Use Next Generation File Formats. Um, and if you provide WebP files, you'll score and that will whatever it is. Isn't that Google? Google come up with WebP? Yeah, I think, it, I think it came from them. And that's the first time it's in Lighthouse. But um, Edge supports it, Firefox supports it, Safari's still on now, um, but it's kind of become relatively widely used. And the really cool thing about the WebP one is um, if I upload an if I upload a JPEG, for example, it will create a WebP version which lives on the server. That's fine, like, that's pretty useful already. But it comes with a child module called WebP Responsive Images. And what that does is if I am um, using the responsive images field format on the Drupal site, as well as doing the usual, like if I'm on 1920, give this big image, if I'm on a small phone screen, with this image. It would also say if you if you browser accepts image form for slash web p as the mind type, it will um, include those in the, in the picture element. So if the browser knows it understands web p, rather than load the JPEG, which is going to take a little bit longer, it will load the web p format file instead. And that just works like out of the box. Um, and that's previously something that was a bit more easy to do, um, but it's not. So the way it works is you, you set up these pipelines and you can choose what processes you want and then you can have a default um, a default processor which all the images on the side will be run through. You can also, if you want, create um, separate processes. So if you had an optimization which was kind of not a lossless compression one, so if it was having an impact on the quality of your images, that might be fine for like the thumbnails that you probably wouldn't want it for your big flashy homepage here or anything. So in that case, you can keep the default as the default pipeline, but you can create a new pipeline with less aggressive compression, and you can use that for your sort of higher impact stuff. So, there are a few other ones I was going to talk about, but they're more development focus, like Bamboo Twig. Um, Bamboo Twig, I'll finish up on this one. It's it's one of those, it's a module where it's kind of difficult to know what to do with it because there's lots of other modules that do similar things. So it provides a load of helper um, twig functions. So if you want to get a image style URL from a file ID or from a public um, URI, um, you can do that in Twig. If you want to format dates, render something, Load something, get the current user, check their permissions, and um, like I said, pull up different image styles, use tokens in Twig, blah 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 blah. Um, Bamboo Twig does all of this stuff. The kind of uncomfortableness is that there's also Twig Tweet, which does all of this stuff. There's also Twig Field Value, which does some of that stuff. There's like Twig Extras or something. There's millions of these Twig modules. The reason why um, my preference is for Bamboo Twig is that it has tests, it has backup documentation, um, and when I've raised issues against it, the maintainer is, is, is responsive and, and actively working on it. So, in, in a sort of quite crowded marketplace or a comprehensive marketplace, Bamboo Twig stands out to me at least, and um, which is why it's something that, that I like to use. Something interesting to watch out for with Bamboo Twig, though. Is it's got a incompatibility with stage file proxy. So stage file proxy is a useful module where if you have environments that you might import the database from a production site, you might not remember to bring more files. So you'll then have a database that contains references to files that don't exist in that testing environment. And what stage file proxy does is it takes over um, Drupal's like requests not that box source not found thing. So rather than letting that image 404, stage file proxy will then step in, <coughs> put it down from the production site and display it on the testing site. So if you've got a client that has had their Drupal site for years and they've got like gigabytes worth of photos, they're never going to bother to like our sync or whatever those files down to your QA environment. So instead you can use stage file proxy. Problem is we do a lot of um, Stuff in Twig 
to get images rather than that driven with them um, itself. We kind of try and be a bit too helpful. So it will check whether the file you're asking for exists itself. And if Bambi Trigger notices that file doesn't exist, it won't output anything. Whereas really what we want Bambi Trigger to do is output something that it knows is going to 404, because that means the better stage our proxy can step in and handle the 404 and give us our image. Um, so there's a patch that I wrote that basically stops it doing that. And the maintainer has been like, oh, thanks for your patch. And um, I don't really want to bring in code that references another module, which is absolutely fair. And um, so it's, it's just hanging out in the issue queue. We can apply it to every project. So it's a really useful module. Um, but it took us so long, probably longer than it should have done, to figure out why that issue of stage file proxy was happening. So I mentioned it now to say it all in the time. There was announced today. This week, I think, a new version of stage file proxy. I don't know if that helps or not. Well, the issue is that Bamboo Twig intercepts the process, so I don't think stage file proxy would help. Do you know what's new in it? So no, I only just saw it while we were sitting outside the building. So, I think it's 1.0. Mm -hmm. The official ADEX. So yeah, <clears throat> did everyone know? Did everyone find at least one new module? Good. Yes. I was really worried that people were like, "I've been using hotkeys for save for years." <laughs> yeah. I don't think any of you would have that attitude, but there's always that nervousness. Pick up a word for the lightning people and improve lightning. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I've never done much of distributions until now. Um, so it might turn out that I put way too much into it, but we can always stress it out. And my answer has kind of been that if it's something I've done, like pretty much every project up to now, it should go in, because otherwise we're just going to keep doing the same things over and over again. Um, so yeah, I've had a bit of like a contra renaissance or something where I used to try and do as much as possible myself, but now. Um, I definitely spend more time than a bunch of modules than like jumping in and trying to do it myself. So, yeah, thanks so much for listening. For me. I have a question. You uh, last week or the week before you were asking about with profiles. I mean, yeah, the updates. modules and updates. So, yeah, I can that. To take the, the configs in the new config stuff. And do the set off thing to wipe out all the like, yeah, that stuff. Awesome. But did you come to any? We did. I did it myself uh, to my colleagues next day, which was, was great. And so the issue we had was we, we used the, another module. The, 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 to, to recap, you were asking about. Yeah, sorry, the context the, is. Configs, yeah. is uh, the config was we had built this thing <coughs> built on 8.7, now 8.8 is out. Trying to work out how to update the distribution rather than individual site. Um, so, we have this module called another module called the config, config profile, and it's a config filter. filter. Um, so, what it does is when you do your config export, config split export, so when we're doing development on, on this thing, um, we use config profile to put the changes we made back into the profile. And we select the them. Um, yeah, and, and we remove like the UUIDs and the config hashes. So to do the 8.8 update, we had to make quite a lot of changes to our composer file. So this isn't config related, but we were doing all the stuff about the new scaffolding process. And um, so that took a while to figure out. And then for the config, um, we kind of had a bit of a manual process involved. So we used config profile to explore. Well, so I think I'll slow down. We spun up an 8.7.8 site, did a config export, updated that site to 8.8, .8, did another config export. Um, and then there are a few manual changes we had to make. So in 8.8, .8, the, um, I think it was file media type was renamed to document. So most people were using it to store like PDFs and, and office documents. So 
through the core in there that's documents, so that they're most friendly. But we already had something that referenced the vehicle file. So we had to make some like manual changes there by dragging the document into copy files from the course copy directory, at least our own ones. And then we had to go through all of our example content um, and change any references that were put in that file to bring that document. That was the sort of more fiddly bit. Uh, the, the step I was missing was just that you can't update it to open a um, without having it open some and then doing the export, which I don't know, maybe that's in the things, but um, it just took a while to figure out because we didn't know where to work with distributions. <coughs> and has anyone like got any questions or knows much of the do some of the stuff I spoke about but differently or better? One of the copy uh, pages. Mm. So that solves the problem where you want to make a site and you've got a home page. You've got this home page. Yes. Yeah. That is actually one of the examples that they did. Um, so, config pages is, is a little bit more complex. Um, but it's a little bit more complex. It's a little bit more interesting one in that there's a very similar module for site settings. Um, so, Really hard to type what I'm talking about. So if you look at this project page, and um, one of the, so the description is at some point I was tired of creating custom pages using many form API, writing tons of code just to map the form and find its settings. And as soon as they want drag or drop or Ajax, things start to get hairy. Same story with the creation of a dedicated content type just to keep a single page like my page. And um, so, yeah, so site settings is, is really similar. And we actually started off with site settings on a client project, and then we switched to using config pages. And the reason for that was site settings, is, it lets you build your forms with the form API. So you get used to it being like super droopy. And you then get to your front end work and maybe you want to print out one of the values that comes from that form. So we had a content type that represented a university program, a good course, and they had some content that appeared on um, pretty much every one of those pages. So we had, a com we had a site settings page where they could configure that content and then we'd render it on each um, node. The problem was like when we wanted to render that into a reference, which was Type of field it was. Comps, um, site settings was just giving us the MCI ID. It turned out you couldn't get a render array out of it. So we really wanted like the user just to be able to pick something and then ask to just be able to render it. And um, that site settings was quite focused on like purely storing strings and so on. So to render that, we then have to load that entity, manually render it, and then print that to the page, which was a pain. It also did some funny things with cardinality. So if you had a entity reference again and it could accept multiple values and the client had selected one value, um, and config page would give you that entity ID as a string. If it selected multiple ones, it would give you an array. So the preference there would be for it to always return an array, but sometimes that array just has one item in it. So all of a sudden we were getting different sort of data structures and types back from the module. It was just really annoying. We ended up writing some web data code to fix it. And it was just like that. Uh, Content pages is much better at that sort of thing. Like, if you want to get a render array out of it, you can. If you want to get just a string value, you can. If you want to use it in a twig file, you can. Um, it will let you generate blocks to show a config page. So, that, that legal text one, um, that's just a block provided by config pages that shows the value of the legal text config page. So it makes it really easy to set um, custom forms up and to feed them. The area where site settings is stronger is translation. So um, config pages has its like this sort of context-based approach. Um, where site settings uses well, you can translate each site setting as if it was a node. So I, I think the there's an issue here um, entry for both of them. It's like comparisons with site settings, comparisons with content pages. I think the sort of the gist of them both is if it's multilingual, site settings is probably best, otherwise, um, content pages in my preference at least. 
Do you consider it a paragraph browser? I really want to. Yeah, I haven't. Well, I haven't looked at it. Do you? Do you? Is it? Yeah, he's a quite one. Is it good? Because yeah, paragraph is nice. Paragraph browser. So if you run on that um, drop down button thing that Phil had in when he was adding in that paragraph before, it throws up a modal window and you can provide a thumbnail for every paragraph. So mm -hmm. to make your own little make believe gooey, that, that's a terrible example of it. <laughs> because we, we made a little sort of design up thumbnails and did a little bit of extra CSS to make it a neat. <coughs> um, yeah, the client sort of that's cool because yeah, paragraphs is, is a bit of a piece, isn't it? In terms of yeah. Back drive. That's, that's something we haven't looked at yet, but and it's nothing on the list. Um, yeah, I'm in two minds about stepping away from paragraphs entirely anyway, but um, yeah, I mean, push a bit more into the custom blocks and layouts. Yeah, the only thing in the room with this stuff is that we we haven't done any layout on the stuff. Um, like a couple of months ago, I looked at it and it was kind of overwhelming. And it was like step like every possible block on the site, and there were patches and there were country modules, and there was no stuff to sort of assess. Yeah. And my, my, my feeling from doing that assessment was like, let's just let it settle for a bit, um, let things calm down, let's see what comes out of the conflict, see where core goes. And at some point, all of this will have to be rewritten to use layout order. Um, I'm sure that's the direction it's going. Mm. Uh, having everything in blocks kind of feels like a by the step. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks everyone again. Thank you. <laughs>